Welcome to AMM 1080 Government Lecture Conclusion. Since we had a council class, this is a video lecture on what we would have covered on Wednesday on October 31st. So the last thing we talked about was sumptuary laws, and I gave you the example, the first sumptuary law that existed um, about limiting uh, the amount of, of gold on their body and um, that, you know, tunic colors couldn't be, uh, be in different colors. And obviously, um, some of the examples we talked about, which was great response from the class, by the way, um, it wasn't because of liability or protection, which some of these laws, that the current ones that we have in our culture, for example, like the, the having shoes, having a shirt, et cetera, we talked about how it varies, the context, the location, all that. But obviously, something like this had nothing to do with safety um, uh, for this example. So... Uh, they're not all about safety. It's just that that happened um, to be the very first sumptuary law that that we had. So another role that government has when it comes to uh, clothing, um, obviously the sumptuary laws is to control how much or what you wear or impose rules on it. But it also uh, helps with protection, particularly consumer protection. So we have consumer protection laws that the government imposes. And the idea is to protect uh, you, the consumer, uh, from faulty um, products. So what they uh, basically are mandating is that anyone who sells uh apparel products, they have to label and they have to follow specific rules with that. So one of the things is that you have to put is the fiber content. So what goes into your apparel product? So you need to know the fiber content, what it's made out of. And it goes from order of the greatest, uh, from least, uh, from most to great, uh, to least. So whatever fiber content it has the most, like if uh, in this picture, it's cotton polyester, it's 55% cotton, 45% polyester, cotton has to be listed first. And they have to tell you um, how to take care of the garment so it doesn't get ruined. So if it's dry clean only, if you can wash it in cold wash, warm wash, can you tumble dry, um, can you iron it, um, any special solvents, all those kind of things have to be on there. You can write it out or you can use international symbols. Um, another thing that uh, they have to put also uh, is information uh, of origin, point of origin, um, so where it was made out of. So if you want to buy just made in the USA or you don't want to buy something from a particular area, then you can see. Um, another thing that they have to do now, uh, some people think the size has to be on there. No, because it could be on an actual tag uh, that's re that, you know, it's just uh, put in with a tag. Uh, tagging gun uh, with a, a tag tail. This is an actual label that has to be sewn on and has to be attached to the actual garment. It needs to withstand uh, a reasonable amount of time um, on the garment. Now, someone can choose to tear it off or cut it off, but it needs to be on there when the consumer purchases the item. Another rule that governments uh, can do is uh, place limits or protections to endangered species. So all this has to do with, uh, in apparel, uh, things like leather, furs, um, like crocodile skin is in big demand, um, things made out of ivory, uh, things like that too, in, you know, or feathers, particular feathers, exotic birds uh, and their feathers for, for apparel. So the idea is to put, uh, impose uh, protective um policies to protect endangered species and that they're not killed off just for the sake of, of, of fashion. Another thing is trades and tar uh, tariffs and quotas so that it limits or potentially limits and protects uh, domestic uh, industries um, so we don't lose, like we've lost a lot of our uh, apparel industry here, but we still have a, a little bit. We still have some, but we did lose a lot to overseas production. Um, and to limit the items that come from a particular uh, area. So we get a lot of stuff made from China, obviously. So if you want to limit that and you want stuff made in other parts and maybe open up industries in other parts, then you would limit, uh, put quotas or tariffs on items coming from a particular area. Uh, just realize a lot of countries and people try to circumvent those uh, quotas um, by, you know, saying the components are from one area, but then they're real, but they're, you know, they're, they're still assembled in that one area you're not supposed to have. Uh, you know, as many. A leadership in dress. So um, in a democratic society such as ours, the, the leader is very important and they are an example. Uh, they represent the country um, or the area, the culture, uh, and their dress is very important. The first lady role, their spouse, 
uh, it's typically a first lady role, is, is a, an important role, actually, and typically uh, is about humanitarian um, efforts. So the idea there is that oftentimes, like in particular, uh, this country, U.S., they really um, look to the first lady to support American apparel like the actual apparel industry here in America. So you can see from former First Lady Michelle Obama um, wearing uh, Narcisco Rodriguez. She wore a lot of uh, American designers, which was great. Um, it's really hard to use examples with Melania Trump um, right now just because it's just so heated and it's it's really, it's really been pretty uh, volatile um, election, especially now with a midterm election coming on. So a lot of designers don't want her to wear anything that they make because it makes them look bad. So it's it's kind of tough uh, to use even her as an example just because of, of what's happening now. But uh, Michelle Obama is a great example of how she used American designers as well as um, uh, Hillary Clinton, all the other uh, f former uh, Barbara Bush, former first ladies. Um, here's a link. I was going to show you this in class, but you need to uh, take a look at this. It's a short video that talks about the influence of uh, the most influential uh, former, you know, first ladies. Um, I think most people know Michelle Obama because it was just recent and most people think uh, only Jackie O, you know, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy was very, you know, pillbox and just very influential. But definitely take a look at the video. Um, because it actually has some pretty good, there's going to be a, t a quiz question in there for quiz four. Um, so take a look at it. But it, it does show how um, you'd be surprised uh, the influence that some of these first ladies had that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Um, so please make sure you, you look at that. But they're representing the country. So absolutely it matters. Now, when it comes to um, how uh, uh, leaders, uh, government leaders dress when it comes to communism and monarchy. Uh, in communism, they use uniforms. They don't... Um, you know, they don't use a special dress. They use a uniform. Now, do you feel that it sets the leader apart more? Um, they don't feel they need the authoritarian image because they feel like their reputation's enough. You know, it causes enough, like, uh, they, they have the reputation. They don't need to display it in such obvious ways. So that's how communism looks at it. They look at it as a uniform. Um, so that's why you can see something like, I don't have a picture, but you can see Putin, you know, walking or, you know, riding a horse without a shirt. Normally you wouldn't see a president doing that. Right. But their way of how leaders should dress is, is a little, obviously a little bit different. It's a co communist country. When it comes to monarchies, kings and queens, they dress very elaborate, so elaborate that, and I give you an example, this is an African king, as you can see, much more elaborate than any, um, average citizen that he's ruling over. But what's in, I mean, look at that. That's very ornate. Now, the thing is that because they dress in monarchies, they dress so ornate because it's such a divide between royalty and the common folk that you can't really mimic that look because it's too ornate. There's too much going on there. It's very hard. They, so they don't dictate fashion at all. Like you don't look to the queen for fashion. You um, would look at courtesans and that's what you look, fashion trendsetters that are actually over the queen. You know, so some of them have affairs, obviously, with some other royalty. Um, this is a good example. Veronica Franco was a Venetian poet and courtesan, um, and she had such an influence on style. Uh, she kind of was a fashion plate because, you know, you, again, you can't really copy the royalty. It's just too ornate. So um, they had uh, the influence. Um, they had a very um, also controversial lifestyle, but um, they're the ones that dictated uh, fashion a little bit better because it was more attainable that way. Uh, it was too hard to imitate the queen because it was too ornate. Now, how government impacts industry. So uh, looking at imperialism, uh, when you look at Western Europe uh, and their impact uh, with clo uh, clothing and textiles, as you can see, you know, we, uh, colonization, you know, you would grow, you would farm or mine your raw materials. So you would actually uh, make the items and then you would sell the finished goods and that would be uh, available for the colony to purchase. But if the government comes in and uh, sets your prices or takes um, your items away, then you basically can starve a colony to death. And that's the idea that that's why you had these revolutions. And that's why you have things in our history and in different histories like Boston Tea Party, that kind of stuff. So um, with taxes and, you know, when the government starts taking too much control or they do something you're not uh, happy with and it, go it goes against what you're trying to do in terms of establishing um, uh, actual markets, then it becomes a problem. So um, yeah, you can't, you know, they could, uh, they, they could either really support like in, in France, you know, how fashion flourished when we talked about the evolution of Western dress and really support, um, the industry or you can hurt it. I mean, that's how much influence uh, the government has. It can support or it can hurt, 
Um, in terms of wartime, just know great, we've already talked about this, so this is all review, but great restriction on clothing, less yardage, clothing production, you have to make less of that, less uh, fabric being used. Um, what's interesting is once the war is over, exact opposite. And French Revolution is a great example, World War II is a great example. You went from uh, less fabric being used to way too much fabric being used. That's why you get those big full uh, circle skirts. Um, but that's universal throughout time. Actually, that's not, it doesn't change. Um, now what's interesting, and it is universal also, uh, is that after wartime, this is really interesting, you really start looking at the styles, um, women's clothing becomes very more feminine, more alluring. And um, the idea is, you know, more attractive and you felt sexier and uh, almost like go forth and repopulate uh, because, you know, um, the soldiers are back after wartime. So it get, becomes much more feminine, more girly like. Um, and you see this every time after a particular war. And whatever is considered feminine in that culture, we see it. It's, it's so interesting, but you see it. Um, so that's something that's universal uh, that we see. In terms of government and education, uh, it's extremely important. The idea is that public education is not just, obviously, it's not just for the wealthy, that everyone has entitled to some, uh, 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 in a democratic, obviously, um, society, is that, you know, everyone's entitled to so at least uh, the minimum in terms of uh, education. And the idea is that it protects, it's protected by the, you know, um, protects the freedom of democracy, uh, it increases in size with the wealth of the middle class. The middle class kind of pays for a lot of this um, in terms of public education, and it's a way to educate and inform the public of main things the society wants it to know. Now, um, one thing that um, uh, is very important, and I think I moved it up a little too early, but was LCA. So part of it, educating people um, is to let them know the options they have and not just depend on the government and LCA is a perfect example of that. So one of the issues we have, and it's becoming controversial, is should we uh, have the government do more measures to, you know, help with all this waste and how we handle all this excess textiles and the pollutants, et cetera. And something that, you know, you can use that government supports is education. Educate businesses, educate people. And LCA is so important to educate in, which stands for life cycle assessment. So the idea is this cradle to grave approach for assessing industrial systems. So the idea is that you evaluate all stages of production in, in, in something you make. So when you're looking at apparel, everything from where the fibers, how the fibers are picked and they're, t they're, they're extracted, all the way to how you spin the yarn, how you weave or knit it, how you make the, the garments, how you dye them, how you tag them, how do you transport them, how do they end up in a retail establishment, and how do they end up with the consumer, and it doesn't end there. Not just how does it end up with the consumer buying it, but how do they use it, how do they take care of it, and lastly, how do they dispose of it? So that's literally cradle to grave approach. All the stages are interdependent, okay? So the idea is, you know, um, you have these thoughts and you have this mindset when you're designing the product and choosing where to source your, your raw materials from. So I'll say it's really important, but the only way you know about it is to be educated in it and you make better decisions. So this is just an example. Um, so the idea is that you can find ways of reducing the waste and it's just more eco-friendly and more sustainable. So that's the idea is that, you know, you, again, that cradle to you think of it all the way up to when they're getting rid of the products. Um, so it, it's better uh, to come up with options that least impact the environment in a negative way. Um, you'd be able to identify if there's a transfer of impact. Sometimes you try to do something better in one area, but it produces a new problem. So shifting that environmental problem from one to the other, you don't want that. And, um, that what helps is again uh, helping make better decisions, particularly in, in raw material acquisition and anywhere, be able to identify anywhere where you can recycle and reuse and uh, have less of a, a stamp. So um, if everyone has this mindset, even as a consumer, as a business owner, as a government agent, everyone benefits. So just to give you an example, I worked at a small a manufacturer and they would get these yarns from Italy and she'd have, she'd manually loom like sweaters and jackets and coats and dresses and skirts. And then she'd have this like cone of leftover yarn. I'm like, and they started piling up in the back and I asked her, Lois, what are you going to do with that? She goes, I don't know. I'm like, I paid for the yardage, but it's not enough to make anything with it. 
not even a single item so i don't know what to do with it so i looked and the colors look so pretty together and i said i'm like would you and that's when i was just starting my line i'm like could could you make some scarves would your knitters knit scarves for me because i think these would make great scarves and i'm like and you don't need a lot so this is perfect so we talked out a price point um she gave me a good price point i was like under you know eight dollars a scarf and i sold them for 25 and what i did is i took each cone I'd line them up and I'd tell the knitter and the knitter would stay after work. They'd do their regular job and they'd stay overtime. And so they got extra work. They got extra a bigger paycheck because they were willing to pay overtime. I got my scarves made out of yarns from Italy, which I wouldn't normally be able to afford. And then the owner, Lois, got money for the yarn that would have just sat there. And she got rid of the cones and, and freed up space. It was like a win-win situation. I sold the scarves for $25 each, so I made a good profit. All I had to do was line them up and tell them, okay, as soon as you run out of one cone, add the other one. And each scarf would be one of a kind. I just did them in color groups. And it was great. It worked out amazing. I did like about 50 scarves. Um, and we used up all that leftover yarn. And it was great. It was beautiful. And I wouldn't be able to afford the yarn unless I did that. This is another example because I was talking to some students years and years ago before we talked about sustainability and they were telling me, well, it's, it's a great idea, but it's not going to happen because you need trims and trims have to be ordered and then they have to be dyed to match and it doesn't work. You can't decorate or ornate anything without, you know, not being sustainable. So I wanted to prove to them, you just got to think outside the box. So I took the student and we walked to the sewing lab and I literally went to the garbage, uh, garbage, the, the garbage can, the trash can. And I took out this folded piece of white fabric. It's one by one rib and it was bright white. Um, so I said, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take this big rectangle of white fat. It's not even that big, but a rectangle of white fabric. And we're going to make a garment with decoration on it. So I took it. Um, we went to the back and someone was dyeing something. So it was leftover like, uh, water with dye. So I dip dyed it and you can't tell from the picture, but it's a little bit more blue on the bottom and it gets lighter and lighter to white on the top. So what I did was I dip dyed the fabric. Um, I let it dry. It was very subtle because it was only leftover, but literally I didn't buy new dye. It was leftover. Um, and then what I did was I cut strips. I cut off. I did a quick pattern. It's like a cut off tee. So I did a, like a little t-shirt, almost like a t-shirt dress. Um, and then I did, there wasn't much left out because it wasn't a lot of fabric. There were strips. So I took, uh, there's a little rect, you know, a rectangle left and I cut strips out of that and I made, you know, small strips. I did a running stitch and I turned them, I joined the edges together and I turned them into circles and then I attached them to the garment. So if I had to cut circles, yes, I wouldn't have enough fabric. But the fact was I used the little bit of fabric left over. I cut rectangular strips. I did a running stitch and then I was able to attach it here. So I thought outside the box. That's what we mean by LCA. Think outside the box, be creative and be more sustainable. It's definitely doable. You can't think business as usual. Think the way things have always been done. You have to think differently. But if you have that eye, you really, and if we train people to at least look into possibilities, um, again, you don't need government interact. Actually, it helps just to have the citizens actually come up with options is super helpful. So definitely everyone has a role they can play when it comes to eliminating some of this waste. Child labor is another area that, that's been a problem. Child labor is, is, is a reality in other countries, obviously. We had it in our early history. We did have kids work in, in um, factories. Um, the idea is you can't fully eliminate it. Unfortunately, they are income providers. But what you can do is provide safer um, facilities, limit the, the amount of hours. A big company like Nike and others should have a tutor come in um, and actually help them with some schooling in factory. Have them in factory if they have to be with their parents, but put them in a safer area um, and give them uh, livable working conditions. Um, and some have had, excuse me, some have had changes. Nike was a problem. Nike, you would see, uh, for the longest time, I didn't buy anything from Nike because I once saw a video and I saw this little kid do the soccer balls and I'm like, I can't do it. I can't, I can't watch a, a company that sells $200, $300 shoes and, you know, a little eight-year-old, nine-year-old is working on their stuff. So I had a problem with Nike uh, and they have worked with several sweatshops, but they did make changes. Um... I admit I wasn't happy with the reaction at first, but they, they raised the minimum wage. They help with improve air quality and oversight practices because that typically is what happened. You'll hear Walmart a lot. We didn't know. We didn't know. Yeah, by the fifth time you get caught by this, like you should know, right? Like five times. Um, but they just claim they don't know. So sending people out, you're doing overseas. 
uh, manufacturing, you need to send people to inspect. Um, but it has done, I, I will definitely give it to them. They, they've definitely improved. So there's always room for improvement. Um, and I showed you the uh, part of the beginning of the, the YouTube link on, on sweatshops. Um, so take a look at this link. But we've definitely done a good job. Now, government needs to enforce this and, you know, have tough punishment for companies that are using sweatshops and abusing child labor. Absolutely. So that's where the government should get involved. That's their job. But even better is if we don't use it um, because businesses are owned by people. So don't exploit human workers. Don't exploit them. And if it starts from that, you don't need the government interfering. Um, you you do your over, own oversight. That's much better than waiting to be punished. Um, so anyways, that concludes um, the influence of government and dress on with culture and people. Thank you for listening.